Please welcome Quinton. Thank you. Um, yeah, so artificial intelligence, uh, this is something that we've heard about uh, for a few years now, simply because we use it in our everyday life, or at least it, it's being used on us. Uh, if you go on Google or Facebook, all the ads you see on the site are just the result of pretty uh, decent uh, algorithm of artificial intelligence uh, that just analyze everything you do in the background. So everything you click on is analyzed. And uh, the result of this is that Google is able to target exactly what you're very likely to buy. Uh, so this is um, one of the not very noble use of artificial intelligence. Um, something that is uh, also not really widely known is that uh, lots of different industries and most of in industries uh, have been using AI for a while now. If you have a look at the bank sector or the power industry, uh, they have embedded AI in their day-to-day -day processes uh, for at least five years. Uh, now, one of the few uh, industries that didn't use, that has, has, uh, hasn't started to use uh, AI is actually the water industry. Uh, and this is something that uh, Richard just said, we're not quite there yet. Um, the, sad, the surprising thing about this is that uh, water utilities uh, still sit on very large data sets. Uh, you were give, giving the example of uh, SCADA earlier on. But it's, it's the same for lots of different data sets. And um, there is actually a high potential uh, to extract value from existing data. Uh, now, how do you do this in practice? How do you use AI uh, in the water sector and what benefits uh, do you get from this? Um, so at Veolia, we actually uh, started um, a bit of a program to investigate what could be done in the field uh, in partnership with different water utilities uh, in Victoria and New Zealand. Uh, and today, I'm going to try to illustrate what can be done in the field through three, three different applications, uh, the production of sewer blockages, uh, production of water burst and leaks, and optimization of water treatment. Um, so the first one, the prediction of sewer blockages, uh, we are doing this one with Western Water, uh, which is one of the 20 or so uh, water utilities of Victoria. Um, so Western Water is uh, considered as a semi-urban water utility, meaning that its network is relatively big, but it doesn't have lots and lots of customers. Uh, in this case, we have roughly uh, 1,300,000 kilometers of sewer mains. Uh, for approximately 60,000 customers. Uh, one of the major problems they have is blockages, uh, approximately 300 blockages a year, uh, in spite of a relatively intensive uh, cleaning and inspection program. Uh, Western Water spend quite a bit of money every year to inspect and clean 5% of their network uh, every year. Um, in this context, what we did with them is we built a model that is able to predict uh, what pipes are more likely to be blocked uh, in the coming year. Um, the way it works is um, there is really no magic behind this, it's just statistics. Um, at a very high level, what we did is that we provided a computer, let's say with all the list of blockages that happened in the last 10 years or so. We also provided all the conditions uh, in which these blockages happen. Uh, so for example, here uh, we can see, mm, oh yeah, we can see that we provided the pipe characteristics. So we give the computer the age, the material, the diameter, the grade, et cetera, uh, of the pipe uh, in which the blockage happened. We also give lots of relevant uh, I would say, characteristics. And for example, one of them is the presence of trees. Why trees? Are simply because blockages are mainly caused by tree roots uh, going into the sewers and then uh, causing a blockage. Um, so we pretty much give uh, lots of this information. And then what the computer does is that it learns the patterns and the set of conditions that can lead to a blockage. And from this, uh, we can actually predict the probability of having a blockage in every pipe of the network. Uh, so in terms of the end result, uh, this is pretty much what it looks like. Uh, what we provided uh, Western Water with is this map uh, that represents the risk of blockage. 
uh, represented here with a color code. So um, yeah, red pipes are very high risk, uh, green pipes are very low risk. I'm sorry for the colorblind people in the assistance, um, but <laughs> what, what you can see here is that in the center of this city, uh, most of the pipes are red. Uh, why is that? Because uh, in this city, we have roughly 50 years old pipe, which are made of asbestos. And the model uh, identified this as the perfect combination for blockages. Um, now, does the model work? Uh, if you have a look at historical data, uh, so the blue dots here represent all the historical blockages over the last 10 years. And uh, without big surprise, the model tends to actually properly identify the areas where uh, blockages may happen. Uh, this is actually fairly easy because uh, the data I'm showing you right now is actually the 10 years of data we use to calibrate the model. So pretty much the model is doing a good job at learning, um, yeah, what a blockage is. Now actually what we did is that we had 11 years of data and we calibrated the model with the 10 first years of data and then we tested it uh, on the last year. So we said, all right, well, here are all the blockages we had last year. Was the model able to predict uh, where they were? Uh, so the results is actually in the form of a graph like this. Uh, here, what we have is that we actually had 30% of the blockages that happened in the last year occurring in the 7% most critical areas of the network. In other terms, it means that if at the start of that year, we told Western Water, okay, you have to clean those 7% of the pipes, we would have avoided a third of the blockages. Uh, so pretty much this gives you an idea of what can be done with existing data sets, which are not perfect, but which you can still extract some value uh, from. Um, now, what happened is we finalized the model development a month ago, and now Western Water has embedded actually that tool in their decision process to target what pipes are gonna be inspected and cleaned. Uh, so hopefully within six months or a year, uh, we should actually see uh, good results from that. Now, another application uh, I'm gonna talk to you about is predicting bursts and uh, leaks on the water network. Uh, this time we did this in New Zealand. Um, so why in New Zealand? Uh, simply because Veolia operates a piece of the water network uh, around Auckland uh, in the charming city of Papakura. Um, and uh, here this is a relatively small network. Um, we have roughly 400 kilometers of pipes for only 21,000 customers. And we have a fair amount of bursts and leaks uh, in the order of 60 bursts uh, per year. Uh, and same thing, what we did with sewer, we actually did it on the water network. Um, in practice, what we did, uh, yeah, it is, it is so similar that I didn't even change the picture, um, but uh, actually what we provided the computer in this case is actually the listing of all the bursts that happened over the last 15 years, give or take, and also all the sets of conditions that we judged relevant uh, to characterize the problem. Uh, at the end of this, uh, we actually ended up having this very similar type of maps where the model tells us that this is actually the center of the city that is the most critical. And why is that? Because simply this is where the oldest pipes are. Um, as you can see, the model is not as good as it was for sewer. Uh, and because for example here you have green pipes but lots of bursts uh, that happened. And that is something that the model missed. Um, why is that? Simply here, because we are lacking a bit of data. On the sewer uh, model, we had roughly uh, 3,000 uh, events in the historical data. Here we had 10 years of data times 60 bursts a year, so roughly 1,000 events. And this is actually something uh, very interesting, is yeah, to actually calibrate an accurate model, uh, it's better to have lots of data. Uh, yeah. Um, now, the interesting thing with this is that we can actually use the model uh, to predict how bad things will become in the future if we do not do anything. Um, as the model takes into account the age of the pipe, we can actually calculate the probability of having burst on every pipe in one year, two years, three years from now, etc. 
so for example here, what this plot shows is actually the number of events we're gonna have over the next roughly 25 years. If we do not do anything, like we just do not change any type. Uh, so here, what we can see is that the rate of burst will increase from 60 to roughly 90 over, uh, let's say, 25 years. Now, what we can do with this is say, all right, what happens if we change uh, two kilometers of pipe a year, which corresponds to roughly 0.5% of the network, five kilometers a year, or 10 kilometers a year? So 10 kilometers represents uh, yeah, a rate of pipe replacement of 2.5%. Uh, I don't know if there is any asset manager but in the room, but you know it's probably something that financially doesn't make lots of sense. Uh, but it still has a very positive impact on the rest, on the rate of burst. Um, so actually on this, uh, what you can do is use this model to target exactly the amount of pipe replacement you have to do uh, to maintain things as they are. Um, now a bit of a financial figure here. Uh, usually what we would do at Papakura is uh, to design those pipe replacement programs we would use the useful life of the pipes, uh, knowing, for example, an asbestos pipe has an average uh, lifespan of uh, 70 years, and so we know that we're gonna, we will change systematically the pipes uh, 70 years after their install date. Um, actually here, uh, if you actually use the prediction of the models, which are actually a bit more accurate because they account for m way more um, characteristics than the material only, uh, what you have is that you can definitely optimize the pipe replacement program and we expect savings in the order of 20 to 30 percent compared to the, I would say, naive uh, replacement strategy based on the useful life of pipes. And as here uh, we are talking about uh, dozens of millions of dollars, uh, yeah, 20 to 30 percent reduction is actually pretty good. Um, so this is one of the benefits that AI can bring to a water utility. Um, the last application I'm gonna talk to you about is actually uh, more uh, about the optimization of water treatment. Um, I'm sorry about the next slide, who's gonna look a lot like a product pitch. Um, it's not. Uh, I'm just going to give you a very quick overview of one uh, device that we've been uh, using with Coliban Water, another water utility in Victoria. Um, so this device uh, called the Swan Boy is actually a floating sensor that we put in our remote reservoirs and that measures in real time the water quality of reservoirs. Um, it's got different sensors and one of them which is uh, pretty interesting, where is it? Yeah, that's the turbidity one. Um, so we have real time turbidity data. Uh, so every hour that data is transmitted and we have access to it. Um, now, interesting thing about this trial is that we actually put um, a swan boy in the Malmesbury Reservoir, uh, which is operated by Coliban Water. Um, and we chose that reservoir uh, because it's feeding another reservoir here, the Mackay, uh, on which Veolia operates a water treatment plant. Um, and the problem that we have at that treatment plant is that we have the turbidity of the raw water uh, that tends to reach pretty high values. Uh, this is actually 10 years of data from the SCADA system uh, that shows that very often uh, we have the turbidity reaching values higher than 15 NTUs. Um, and because of that, each time it happens, we have to increase the dosing of chemicals at the plant. Now, why do we have these peaks? Uh, well, mostly because uh, the water from the Malmesbury upstream is sometimes not very, 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 yeah, very clear. Um, and so what happens is, um, the idea is if we can measure in real time the water quality in, whoops, in, uh, in here, uh, we can decide to close or open the connection channel so we can avoid actually that dirty water to go in the Mackey Reservoir. Um, long story short, uh, in practice, this is uh, not very easy uh, because actually the turbidity in the Mackey Reservoir depends on multiple parameters. Um, and what we did actually to predict the turbidity is we actually used an AI model uh, to, uh, yeah, uh, to actually predict how the turbidity will vary in the next 30 days. Um, again, 
this is because we have like lots of historical data, 10 years, uh, and uh, things that we can uh, try to, yeah, lots of data actually is the key here. Uh, based on that, what we did, we built that uh, model that is able to predict uh, turbidity in the Mac um, These represent a time series of 30 days, um, and what we see is that the predictions in orange are in line with the observations in blue, uh, which means that now we can actually use this AI model to decide whether or not we're going to close or open the channel. The idea is if the model tells us that if we open the channel, the turbidity is going to exceed this 15 NTU, uh, we're not going to do it and wait for the water quality in the Malmesbury to improve uh, before we do this. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Quentin. That was very interesting. Um, do we have any questions for Quentin? Bruce? So does the blockage model take into account trade waste and intensity of trade waste in the, in the network? Uh, it could. Uh, this is something we could factor in. It wasn't uh, identified as a main cause of issue at Western Water. Uh, but no, no, we, we do not account for that. Uh, something we account for uh, as an interesting parameter is the presence of roads uh, and railways um, as a, another thing that wasn't mentioned on that little picture I showed you uh, simply because of the vibrations and that can actually impact uh, yeah, the blockages. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, just a quick one on the water treatment plant optimization you did. Um, when you could predict your turbidity and potentially UVT or anything else you were measuring, could you preempt water treatment operations? Yeah, uh, potentially you could. Um, so on your first point here, you could potentially predict other things uh, as long as you have data. Uh, so that's that's a bit of a limitation with AI. You always need a good data set, so what you want to predict, you have to get it measured uh, for a few years. Uh, and then, yeah, yeah, you could potentially uh, optimize the treatment at the plant. Uh, so in prediction of what's going to happen if you cannot avoid it. Uh, yeah, yeah, potentially you could. Uh, yeah, that is like our approach is more like simple. Uh, we just say, all right, well, we, there is one thing we're going to adjust, which is if we open or close the channel. Uh, but definitely we could potentially optimize the processes, yeah, yeah. Uh, one question Yeah, so this is something uh, that we wanted to have a look. Uh, now, we don't have enough data to have a very um, yeah, um, a very fine temporal grid, meaning that we are able to have a relatively good accuracy on a period of one year. Can tell you if that pipe is gonna break or have a blockage over one year. Now going down to six months or three months, uh, yeah, that is something that we cannot do at the moment. Uh, yeah. I did have one question as well, sorry. Um, with your water network mm -hmm. modeling, uh, you only had the one intervention of replacement. Um, did you consider other interventions like pressure management to reduce the likelihood of birth? Yeah, uh, actually something interesting. Um, so something that we did um, as a bit of a pre-analysis of all the data, we tried to, uh, to see if the pressure had an impact on the occurrence of burst, and actually it didn't on our data set, uh, whatever the pressure. Uh, yeah, it doesn't impact whether or not a burst will happen. Uh, what it's going to impact is the leak leakage rate uh, from the burst or the leak. Uh, so yeah, that, that's why we haven't really considered this as a potential uh, leverage like that. Yeah. Um, no? Great. Cool. Can we all thank Quentin for his time?